Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're all doing phenomenal. Happy holidays. And boy, do we have an amazing episode for this time around. But of course, once again, the top 10 best performances of the greatest actors of all time. But what's even more special around this time is that I have a phenomenal human being jumping in and helping me with this. I love this human being with all of my heart. Uh, we worked together for years. When is he? Yes, where is he? I think he's uh, on this laptop thousands of miles away from me currently but he has appeared out of the grace of his own of his own heart especially with how busy of a schedule that he has as a phenomenal musician actor artist uh, he is just one of the greatest human beings I know anyone will be able to know so please help me welcome the amazing Ryan Rimar Wow that's very very sweet introduction I could go Alex. on Ryan, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to do this. Oh, and I love you. Let's just do an hour long video of us complimenting one another. I would love that. That would definitely just uh, make this world a lot better, better of a place, wouldn't it? You could do five minutes on your boyish charm. Boyish charm. <laughs> well, we could do, we could do eight hours of just how damn sexy you are. <laughs> Yeah, we'd be the only two people watching that video. <laughs> one of my idols, which I know is one of your great idols as well growing up. And of course, that is the chairman of the board himself, Old Blue Eyes, Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Man, I Absolutely. love it. So um, when I was uh, probably 11 or 12, 12, I guess, uh, there was a movie called Quiz Show that came out. Yes. And I remember watching that at my grandparents' house, and uh, Mac the Knife by Bobby Darren was playing uh, during the credits. Mm. And I was like, what is this song? This is the greatest song I've ever heard in my life. I need to hear more of this. And my grandfather was like, oh, that's Bobby Darren. So he started playing me these records. And at that point, like I had known who Frank Sinatra was, cause you know, I was 12 years old. Like, you know who that is but I never really paid that much attention until he started playing me some of this older stuff and I really got into Sinatra and I was like, holy moly, mm -hmm. this is the stuff I love. Where has this been? Mm -hmm. And then when I became an adult and I moved to Vegas and I realized that I could kind of sing, I started singing it more and I really fell in love with it. And it's just, his style of music is the number one thing for me like that hits my heart uh, and in terms of uh, art to go. Like I could hear his songs and it, it takes me back to a certain time or ev evokes some sort of emotion. And he kind of lends that to his acting style as well. You know, he used to say that you, he wouldn't sing a song unless he could sell the lyrics to someone. And I feel like there's a lot of his performances where it's the same kind of deal, where it's like, if I can't sell this to an audience, I'm not gonna do it. And I have a huge respect for that. So that is what really keeps me a fan of his you know, 30 years after he's been gone, 25, 25 years after he's been gone. Yeah, exactly. And that's why he has a legacy. If you're that good, you're that good. Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna go, go your time on the earth has passed. That work is still there. And it will be forever because people will keep that alive because some of that stuff's just hard to top. Growing up in Hoboken, good old Hoboken, and mm -hmm. family, and especially how he got started with um, singing on the streets of New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, just, as a kid. Uh, first, it started off as like singing, you know, for for cigarettes and for like candy, and then singing for money. And now, yeah. like, but did you know this about him as well? Is that when he was born, his eardrum was perforated, in which later dismissed him from even serving during World War II. I did know that. It's a fascinating story because you wonder where things would have went. It's amazing all throughout that time he just progressed even more with like traveling with you know the Hoboken Four with the Tommy Dorsey band and then a lot that, of that early his voice sounded so drastically different than it did you know like 1960s or 1970s Frank yep I mean because he was really a kid I mean some of that stuff he's like 19 years old you know some of those recordings he's super young yeah uh, and such a purity in his voice in some of that earlier stuff. Some of those things he recorded with that band, The High Lows. I think most people are really more familiar when he made that transition with Nelson Riddle. And that's yeah. real transformation, like really happened with, you know, you got all the big hits with Comply With Me, you know, Love and Marriage. 
that was kind of one of those relationships like when Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones started working together. It's like, oh, now you're going to be a mega star. To this day, every time I hear even just the basic of it was a very good year, my kind of town, fly me to the moon, I, I just, you know, I die and go to heaven. Yeah. And it, it, it's a catalog that's really vast. I mean, he spent a large portion of his life in the recording studio. Yeah. Even the covers that he he's done are really beautiful. I mean, I mean, he did a cover of Sweet Caroline. He did a cover of It Ain't Easy Being Green. Yes. You know, I mean, that stuff, and it's still fun. Like, he's mm -hmm. just not how to sell stuff. And, and obviously, that's what makes you, know, you just such an amazing artist today, man, because every time that which you sing, your voice really is so reminiscent of Frank. And, um, that could, and it's really your own voice. That's what's magical. But, you know, you feel that magic of every time that you sing. Uh, once again, as I mentioned previously in the uh, introduction, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ryan is one of the great uh, musicians today. And he has um, you have, you know, quite a number of um, uh, recordings that you've actually re released, yeah? We recorded a couple things. It's been a few years since we recorded the last one. Um, but, you know, I don't, I, the term musician makes me sound better than I am because I don't, I, I can't really write the stuff, but I can feel it. And I feel like I can convey that feeling to other people as a singer. But I don't know that, um, that I consider myself a musician. I thank you if, if you do. God bless you. Um, One thousand percent. Because uh, you know, because a real musician, you know, the the voice is still you know playing an instrument. So when you're sure. playing your voice, I mean, you follow that through, through and through. Thank and, you. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and as I quote the great underrated classic Step Brothers, you have a voice that's like a combination of Fergie and Jesus. So, isn't that what we all strive for? The combination of Fergie and Jesus. Yes, always. No, that's what. I but I'm I'm really excited to get into this, uh, especially as we go through uh, the top ten best performances he's ever given in film, specifically because I know as an actor he definitely was just one of those captivating artists that nobody would ever really expect. And when you think of like artists, singers turned actors, to, in my book. I know at least he's just like in the top five best of all time, ever. Oh, like, for sure. Yeah, he's not the type of actor that I think uh, Stanislavski would necessarily applaud, yeah. but but he he knows the characters that he needs to play. He, he knew what it took to convey those, those uh, emotions to the audience, and he did it. I mean, like, that's my thing always with the method has always been, like, if it works for you, do it. If it doesn't, don't. There's no right or wrong. Do whatever the hell you gotta do to get that performance. 100%. If you have to live in for a year to play Lincoln, okay, do it. Do it. We never consult about these beforehand, so it's almost like a reaction of what we're gonna have as well, as far as what Ryan's personal top 10 is and what my personal top 10 is. So I'm. it's gonna be really, really fun to be able to see and to kind of break it down one by one. Yeah, let's get started, man. As we talk about the top 10 best performances of Frank Sinatra, Swoon Natra, as I've heard a couple times. <laughs> what is your number 10? Uh, I feel like it may shock you because I, I feel like you personally are going to expect me to have this higher on the list than it is. But my number 10 is 1955's Man with the Golden Arm. Oh my goodness. I am literally shocked. I am literally you, shocked. You thought it was going to be higher on the list? I thought it was going to be much, much higher. Yes. Um, I I mean, it, you know, it's that, that movie that's got a taste of noir to it that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and and a, a film about addiction. And, clearly speaks to me on several levels um and i pre and it's it almost hurts me to put it that low on the list but there are some movies that while they may not be as well crafted or whole of a film there's a lot of sentimentality and nostalgia that go into some of my higher picks mm -hmm. um right there's a lot of a lot of frank's dramas uh as great as they are there's one thing missing from them, and that's that he doesn't sing in them. That's not to discredit the man with the golden arm because it's fantastic and he's wonderful in it. Oh yeah, man. 
the first time I saw it, I thought maybe it was about Roger Clemens or some sort of pitcher in the major, major league baseball. Um, yes. It is not. That is not what it's about. No, quite it the opposite. Not. I'll tell you, I'll, the first time I saw the title, I thought it was just like, ooh, this is the James Bond one. I didn't know Frank Sinatra played James Bond. Yeah, it's a little darker than most Bond movies tend to get. Quite dark. Quite dark. <laughs> that your number 10 is not the man with the golden arm quote far from it indeed but my number 10 is a hole in the head okay yep it was the second to last film directed by one of my personal favorite directors of all time frank capra base based on the play of course by arnold shulman and of course frank plays tony Manetta. he's a widowed father who owns a hotel in miami he can't make the payments anymore so he asks his brother mario who is played phenomenally by Edward G. Robinson. I freaking love Edward G. Robinson and anything that he does. But uh, he asks him to bail him out, and Mario gives him an ultimatum to either give up his 12-year-old son or marry a sensible woman, since Frank in the film can't stop his womanizing. Uh, <laughs> I, so, it's a big stretch for Frank. Big, that's big what stretch. I would say. Notoriously being an actor on set who would want to start filming later on in the day. So he could, not, he could not be on set like almost like past 4 p.m., sometimes even 5 p.m., which would drive, you know, specifically Frank Capra nuts. But Frank Capra was smart enough to do those long cinema scope takes. <laughs> I'm not showing up till noon. scooby da da doo doo day. I'm not coming up. I'm not, I'm not showing up here then past 5. Also, yeah. what I love so much about it, too, is that also the little gem, it features his classic High Hopes by Van uh, yeah. On, which obviously won the Oscar that year for best songs. But what about you, man? What's your what's your numero nueve? Number nine. I don't know. This might shock you as well. And I have a lot to say about uh, about this one. Yeah. Is in uh, sixties Ocean's Eleven. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yes. You know, you. obviously, what a cast. I mean, clearly, that's it, it's almost a gimmick at that point. When you have, it's like the Expendables, where it's like is the movie any good because everybody's a, a name you know obviously frank and Gene and sammy but you got you know uh, mr roper nice is in there oh, to funny. me I, I i hesitate to say this where anybody's going to be able to hear it i kind of like the remake better my ears are bleeding i know but, but i don't know if it's the 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 dynamic between uh, brad pitt and george clooney it, it, it's so charming and the the heist movie is elevated when it's a little more current obviously with tech uh and maybe i'm a little biased living in vegas oceans 11 is kind of a thing you know what's really funny about oceans 11 too is that apparently frank asked a favor from billy wilder the oscar-winning writer director to do some touch-ups on the script in exchange for a picasso painting really really i think that's why the script is a little <laughs> It has more charm to it, and it fits everyone's yeah. personality just way, way better. It makes it richer. Yeah, and a thing that they seem to accomplish in both the original and the remake, maybe even more so in the original, is the element of cool, because these guys are cool. So like, they yeah. just walk, and the way shots are the music and just the, some of the angles and stuff the way that they're strolling is just like well the audience knows these are the coolest guys in the planet right now mm -hmm. you know and we buy it we buy it and their dialogue reflects that kind of stuff too because they get these little one-liners or like there's so many moments where sammy will just be like almost looking at the camera but not really but yeah. it feels like a wink to the audience sometimes like he's literally so, like bugging to the they, audience they, all those guys have that's why I, I always say Ocean's Eleven is like the definitive like Rat Pack movie. It's fun. It's a fun movie. Nobody's going to the theater to see On the Road to Mandalay and expecting it to be, you know, this epic thing. They're there to be entertained and have a good time. And mm -hmm. when you watch movies like Eleven, it's best to go in with that in mind and don't look for plot holes or any type of things like that and just enjoy the ride because it's a fun heist movie just you're essentially rooting for the bad guys anyway my number nine i'm not sure if this might shock you but um i honestly the more i was kind of like thinking about it i almost wish it was much higher 
But my number nine is Anchors Away. Ooh, okay. Number yeah. nine. Anchors Away. Brooklyn? Flatbush. Well, what do you know? Oh, I love Anchors Away so much. Um, it was actually, I mean, with it being the first and in my opinion, the best of the three collaborations between Frank and Gene Kelly, I, I can't, I can't get enough of it. I mean, I love On the Town. I freaking love On the Town and Take Me Out to the Ball Game so very much. This being the very first collab I've ever seen between, between them, it just holds a much more special place in my heart and uh, it just remains one of the great examples of how hilarious a how hilarious a comedic actor frank can be but also how hard he can work in matching the brilliance that is gene kelly in the art of dance you know it took frank sinatra eight weeks to learn uh the dance routine for the whole birthing area scene i mean they ultimately did like 72 takes to get that whole movement down to get the right footage and this was like his first major break yeah. as an actor and even receiving top billing too over gene so it was a huge thing apparently he felt really upstaged by gene in this film which i can understand since gene was actually nominated for best actor which he for this movie which he wholeheartedly deserved but i just remember all the sweet and funny moments mm -hmm. frank plus how he sings what makes the sunset in that scene while Gene is, is dancing with another another woman, the way he croons that song, I remember as a kid, mm -hmm. inspired me heavily. That's a perfect example, that moment of if somebody doesn't know what crooning is, mm -hmm. that's that's a perfect clip to show them. Yeah. Because you're making love to that microphone, you're making love to that song, and everything out of your soul at that moment is not for you it's for everybody else it may be a cathartic expressive experience for you but that's a gift to everyone else if somebody that's that talented and that capable giving you that live giving you that on a, on a record giving you that in any capacity to relive it and stuff it's a real it's a gift and, and it's a perfect example of why he's the crooner okay my number eight is uh is another one that had you know the rat packy guys in it and while oceans 11 might be a better film i have robin and the seven hoods at oh, number eight classic um i think it's a little more fun than oceans 11 maybe not story wise but the the characters are fun um the whole mr booze number yes. is killer like it's so funny parodied that whole scene on Family Guy, like, and obviously the most memorable song probably from that show or that movie, My Kind of Town, of course. which is, you know, iconic, went on to be one of the most recognizable hymns of Frank Sinatra. Yeah, like, it's a great song. It's a fun movie. And it's another one where like, you know, Sammy and these guys have their own kind of fleshed out characters where they're not really just playing versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. But you can tell watching movies like Ocean's Eleven, Robin and the Seven Hoods, even Guys and Dolls, where some of these guys, their friendships are really coming across in their performance. You know, like you, it's fun to watch people that are buddies. Yeah. You know, and, and if you can get an entertaining story, great music in there too. It's just a fun watch. It's a fun movie. It is so fun. And it's just. And Bing Crosby, come on. My number eight is Some Came Running. I must say, I love this film so very much. And, um, oh, and expect a singular movie review on this film very soon on the Patreon page, ladies and gentlemen, which you can subscribe right here. Thank you very much. That's my plug. Okay. <laughs> Based on <laughs> the novel, is Sinatra plays Dave Hirsch, a military vet and accredited writer who returns to his hometown almost accidentally with a new floozy of a girlfriend played absolutely adoringly by Shirley MacLaine in an Oscar-nominated performance. and. He visits his older brother, played fantastically by Arthur Kennedy, in another Oscar-nominated performance as well. And then he must come to terms with the family secrets that has burned him for years and years, but at the same time, try to bring life to his writing career once more. But he can't do that without falling in love with Gwen French, played by Martha Heyer, also in an Oscar-nominated performance. So. Clearly, this is such a film that is blossomed by an amazing ensemble. And Frank leads it like so brilliantly, having to tackle 
a character wanting to change. Oh, no. His whole past is just bringing him down. But this film was notorious. I mean, this was like the big one, the big tension-filled set uh, for Sinatra because he kept battling with its director, freaking Oscar winner Vincent Minnelli. Because Minnelli was such a perfectionist, he kept trying to get more and more takes out of Sinatra, but Sinatra was just like, okay, forget, no, I'm not doing this. And he would often storm off sets with Dino. Technically, this was the very first partnership between Frank and Dean. And the unofficial Rat Pack member as well, Shirley MacLaine because of how good she was with the boys. The only female member. The only female member. I think what helps it too is that uh, Minnelli, like Capra, he understood how if Frank isn't gonna give like more than one take, we have to go CinemaScope, really film long takes with Frank doing, you know, these deep and long running scenes, which is another showcase of how great of an actor Frank could be. Well, those long takes really, um they bring a, a heart to a lot of scenes the, in the way that a play does. Yes. If you have too many like quick little cuts in between it, it doesn't give the actor enough time to really feel what we're trying to make the audience feel. Right. And you have long takes like a like kind of like a play where you can really build things and, and people are along that ride. They're not taken out of it by a cut. They're in it with you. And while it may have been done that way because of Frank being a you know pain and, and demanding a schedule a certain way it, those type of things end up working as a benefit in the long run because it's like yeah but look we wouldn't have done this 10 minute take otherwise right and look you know and I think there's a lot of Capra movies that, that do that though too because you mentioned Capra earlier uh, and that's I think the charm in a lot of those things is it, those long takes if you have the right actors they don't feel long and tedious they help everything I think Number seven, uh, another combo of Bing Crosby and Grace Kelly. I'm sorry, but also Grace Kelly. Um, yeah. High Society. High Society. Nice. Society. It's hard not to love this movie. Yeah. I I enjoy Bing Crosby. I I don't think he's quite as uh, high on a pedestal as maybe some of these other people of this era kind of put him. Vocally, I feel like Frank is leaps and bounds better, yeah. but there's people I dispute that. Regardless, he's great in this, and the three of them are great in this. It's Grace Kelly. Oh. She's oh. gorgeous. This movie, maybe not more than other stuff, but, but definitely in this movie, she really has a quality, and the only word to describe it is Grace. Yes. And you know what I mean? Like, there's an elegance to her. I mean, the movie's called High Society, so you might go in thinking that right but she's she's um hard to take your eyes off of in this film it, it she followed through with actually getting married and becoming a princess literally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah sure it, 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 checks, it, it checks out completely it, <laughs> and also uh the songs in that um might not be quite as like uh recognizable as stuff like fly me to the moon but there's a song called mind if i make love to you that's in that show in that movie mm -hmm. and, i mean there's been countless covers of that for the last 60 years i mean up until a few years ago harry connick jr did a cover of it it's beautiful and it's just one of those songs that it, it kind of fell through the cracks in terms of frank's career because there's so many other bangers that everybody knows but it's it's really a nice song true love is in that you know True Love, Cole, which, you know, Porter. Cole, Porter, Cole Porter's classic, yeah. The Master Craftsman, yeah. And it was nominated for Best Original Song at the Oscars that year. Only nominated. Mm -hmm. It was wild. Yeah. You know that famous picture of him from his mugshot? I have that photo above my dog's bowl because her name is Frankie. Yeah. So her mugshot's right above there. And it's on there. You know, it has the date and everything. And do you know what he's charged with? What is he charged with? He was 19 in that picture. Yeah. And he was charged with seduction because in that time it was illegal to like, you know, to go after somebody's wife. Like yeah. it was a yeah. that's married. It's, it was, and he got arrested for it. I mean, I'm sure there was some sort of bail or something, but on there, unless there's been some altering that I don't know about, it says, <laughs> 
the seduction was the charge. Wow. About That's getting arrested for something like, what are you in for? <laughs> well. Well. <laughs> <laughs> My number seven, Pal Joey. The, okay. Yep, the film adaptation of the 1940 Rodgers and Hart musical, which originally starred Gene Kelly as the title role on Broadway. Joey Evans is the handsome, charming, second-rate singing heel who's in the middle of a love triangle between Rita Hayworth and Kim Novak. I mean, come on, it just makes all the sense in the world. Um, I did actually speak about this film uh, on my other video talking about Rita Hayworth and her performance. This is such a great showcase of Frank with his singing, classic singing performance of The Lady is a Tramp and Bewitched and also features uh, My Funny Valentine, but is actually sung by Kim Novak's character, actually dubbed by Trudy Stevens. You know, Frank actually did something really swell about this. He was billed second under Rita Hayworth, and Rita Hayworth got top billing. The press asked Frank about that, and he said, well, hey, I don't mind taking second billing right after Rita Hayworth, because this was a Columbia Pictures movie, and Rita Hayworth was Columbia Pictures. Like, Columbia Pictures would be nothing without Rita Hayworth. And this was all in Frank's own words. And he's like, and if I'm sandwiched between Rita Hayworth and Kim Novak, hey, that's a pretty good sandwich to be to be in. <laughs> I actually have Pal Joey as my number six. No kidding. <clears throat> kind of a in there. That's hilarious. Yeah. Perfect. I'm right. The song in that, in that movie that really stands out to me the most is one of my favorites called I Could Write a Book. Yes. That's a great Beautiful. One. That's a great one. Did I ever tell you about, I used to have a poster of Rita Hayworth um, in my bedroom and I used it to, I was really into digging. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, sure. and um, nights, nights on end, you would just be like digging, you know, behind the poster. Digging. Know, just digging. Yep. And then it turns out, you know, the guy that owned the apartment came in one day and threw a rock at it. Mm -hmm. And and then he realized where my big hole was. Turns out, <laughs> while it's different in the Shawshank Redemption, if you <laughs> hole through your wall, but you live in an apartment, you just go to the neighbor's house and they're very upset about it. So oh. it's a little outcome oh. then. <laughs> then, then going, then going, then, then going through a real shitter. Yeah, yeah. He oh. climbed through five miles of filth. I can't even imagine. And in classic Frank style, you know, the the film was adapted and rearranged to Frank's strengths, and it really showcased more of you know Frank's you know abilities and personality. And it ended up earning him a Golden Globe anyway for Best Actor. And number six for me is and i actually want to place this higher but you know i think it's just you know no choice but number six for me is the joker is wild really underrated in my opinion it's the only technically biography frank ever did where he plays the famous comedian joe e lewis who actually started off his career as a nightclub singer but then threats and attacks from the mob whom he worked for stopped him from singing which they actually threatened him by slashing his throat. And, but he turned the tables and became a beloved comedian. And it's, it's fantastic what Frank does to it, with obviously the first half of his career being such a crooner, a beloved nightclub singer, um, going through the battles of working with the mob. And then when you tie that into Frank's own life, where there was always that speculation and controversy where Frank Sinatra has those ties with the mob and how is this going to help progress his career? And is that even why he has the career he has? And all of that, you know, gossip and debates that's been carrying on for years and years. But, uh, but also on the other side of it, where Frank gets to showcase his abilities as a comedian. Uh, Frank apparently read the biography of Joe E. Lewis and he was just like immediately taken by it. And he paid for the rights for the book immediately. I, and that's what I love so much about Frank too, is like whenever he, he read something or saw a project, that he really had passion for, he just went out and did it. He got the money and he just like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna do it. I don't care how much it costs, like, let, let's do it. He's just, oh, I, this is a passion project. Let's get it done. Let's just get it done. And this was one of those great classics where he recorded all of his music, all of his songs um, on sets. Like, there was no pre-recording. He actually recorded them 
all on all on set. You know, being a creature of the nightclub, he loved the, the he, he said in his own words, he loved the sound of chairs scraping together, uh, people coughing in the back, you know, mm -hmm. you know, glasses, like cocktail glasses, you know, clinking together. He just loved that environment. And that's where, you know, and that's why this movie and his performance feels so lived in and so real <clears throat> that you, you know, gravitate to him much, much more so. And also famously, it, it another film that won the Oscar for Best Original Song, this time for one of my favorites and, you know, honestly, one of just the world's favorites all the way, you know, also written by Ben Husen and Khan. One of my favorite Sinatra songs ever. Yeah. All the way. It's, it's got a, a quality of longing to it, mm -hmm. you know, that really, uh, in the hands of a lesser vocalist uh, wouldn't really come over quite as strong the longing you know yeah. uh, I've heard a million covers of that song but nobody sings it like that yeah and you've covered it as well haven't you I have I have I don't sing it like that either nobody sings it like Frank does I mean there's a pain kind of in his voice but it's that's part of his thing is that he knows what the song is and what it calls for and what it takes to sell the romance song that works in a lot of different uh ways you know you can play that at a wedding you can play that at a funeral yeah you can play it at an insurance convention you know it works beautifully <laughs> yeah when somebody loves you it's no good unless they love you all the way just like state farm <laughs> yeah that was actually their first, that was actually Farmer's first choice until they were just like, ah, oh, damn it, State Farm. Yeah. I have no choice but to do J.K. Simmons. All right. So. <laughs> yeah, they, they went from one of the greatest songs, Sammy Kahn and James Van Houston, right, all the way. Yeah. 60 years, beautiful song, but they changed and decided to go with bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 that, we... that's, the, that's the Farmer's jingle instead. Yeah. I think, <laughs> so. It was a tough decision, but they, they followed through, you know, they, yeah. 